look at recently when you think of all the the crypto exchanges that went belly up you know regardless of what you think about you know the crypto industry just look at the the attitudes and behaviors of these people who were put into position of power to steward these people's money and their greed ended up bankrupting millions of people that's the thing for me that's just blows my mind welcome to personal finance cat where i share my personal take on personal finance hi parker welcome to the show how are you doing good thanks for having me on today yeah of course you are currently the ceo of um this company eqrp is that right correct yeah can you let us know sort of your journey because i understand from your bio that um you might have spent some time, had some experience at Chick-fil-A and Purcell Farms, which uh, significantly influenced your approach to leadership and stewardship, which I'm sure played an important role <laughs> for your current role as a CEO. Can you talk yeah. about a moment where you transitioned from those companies or organizations to EQRP? Yeah, so when I graduated college, in 2013 at Auburn University. Uh, really, Chick-fil-A was like my first start to learning, my, I'd say my leadership style, my leadership journey where I kind of cut my teeth. Uh, and it was unbelievable experience. Uh, I'd still fall on the sword for that company today. But, you know, three years working there, you've heard of Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule, right? Like mm -hmm. I put in 10,000 plus hours at Chick-fil-A. So I'd like to think that I was a master of the things that I did there, getting to understand the culture. And so for me, uh, I think the biggest takeaway that I took from there was win the heart before you win the mind, because you know, nobody's going to listen to you in life if they don't know that you care about them first. And so like, you've got to win them here before they'll even consider what you're trying to uh, maybe give them from an information standpoint or feedback, whatever it is, uh, logically. So uh, from there, our family business, uh, Purcell Farms, I transitioned after uh, I decided to go back and help my father with the big development that we had there and also in hospitality. So what's, what's interesting is like my first, we'll call it seven years of my professional journey was in hospitality. So you know, I was working at Chick-fil-A, you know, working Henny Pennies, making chicken sandwiches. And then I go back and I'm like building shipping and delivery centers, housekeeping, doing some sales. Like it's just chaotic, just serving people. And I love it. But when COVID hit in 2020, uh, I decided to step out into unemployment. And so from there, uh, I really took a bet on myself because I felt like I'd hit a ceiling and I had all this experience and knowledge and education. I'm a builder by nature. So I'm not someone that's going to sit inside. We'll just say your traditional bank, like show up nine to five every day, push a couple buttons, leave like just, you know, I, I can't do that. I've got this entrepreneurial gene in me. And so I wanted to come be a part of an organization. I didn't at the time know what that was going to be, but I wanted to come help build something that mattered. And so for eight months, I pressure washed and found this company. Uh, I had no idea what it was. It really came through a friend of mine and we would just meet and have a couple beers every week. And he uh, said, Hey, I want you to come talk with this guy that I just started working for. I was like, okay. And so, you know, lo and behold, he showed up, shared his vision. He's a great salesman, by the way, and uh, sold me on an opportunity to come help build something, uh, which was, you know, the EQRP stands for enhanced qualified retirement plan. And what we do is we use the self-directed retirement system to help empower people to take control over their financial lives. So uh, when I came in over three years ago, I just came in to help. I didn't even have a title to be quite honest. We're like, hey, we just need you to do some of these things and help fix some of this stuff. I was like, cool. I was happy to have a paycheck. And so from there, I just really took everything that I learned from my previous experiences, applied it to this business and finance. And, and funny enough, this company ended up changing my life because there was a massive gap for me when it came to finance, because I watched my family, you know, build this tremendous asset and they were able to acquire wealth in a way that I saw it, but I didn't understand how it worked, right? I didn't really understand how money worked. Um, and so for me, like coming here, that was the biggest gift that I got was being able to help come alongside people who were on that same journey. And so as they were learning, I also got to learn myself 
but we did it through the self-directed retirement system. So, uh, yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird journey, right? Cause you go from making chicken to cleaning, to cleaning toilets, to then going to pressure washing. And now I'm running a finance company. So, you know, God has a funny way of working, but I'm in love with what I do, love the people I work with and love the people I get to serve. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all that uh, experience and your journey up until this point. It's uh, it kind of partially answered my next question because um, that, that was my first question too. How did you transition from such a different industry into finance? <laughs> um, and then you mentioned, you know, that was kind of by accident, I would say, and, and the mm -hmm. pandemic really um, maybe was part of that. So can you talk about the challenges a little bit more during the pandemic? What are some of the, you know, thoughts that went through your head and um, what particularly made you pick this opportunity versus I'm sure there are maybe other opportunities yeah. That are presented? Yeah, for me, uh, like I had probably about, I don't know, 15 opportunities that I chased during that time, but I wasn't at peace with a lot of them. And uh, there wasn't a meeting I didn't take either because I just didn't know how that next opportunity was going to come. But really, the for me, I wanted to be at a place where I felt like I was going to be able to add value with my experience. I was going to be able to help build something. Um, and there was also a, a level of like getting a very clear understanding of what I liked and what I didn't like. Meaning when I was when I reflected on my past experience, what brought me joy and so when I made that list out, like when I was at my happiest, this is what I was doing. OK, that was the, the list to which I was working off of. And then I had the other side of it as I was filtering these opportunities. Well, when you when you were at your worst or most stressed or at least happy, what were you doing? And it came down to it, like even the littlest thing, right, even up to a strategic level. So I used that to help pick the next thing. And I didn't care what it was as long as it fit. This is where Parker finds most joy. And the two opportunities that I had was this. And then there was another one that was uh, a, a benefits consulting job. I'm a type one diabetic. I have been since I was eight months old. And so I was like, okay, I could connect with this and individuals who need healthcare, you name it. But then there was a part of me that was just like, you know, I just really don't like the healthcare industry, although I um, <laughs> use it, right? Uh, and so this seemed like the best opportunity for me. And I was like, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? I could just be unemployed again and I already know what that feels like. So, you know, I just go back out and pressure wash it again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, that makes sense. What do you think the principles that you learned from stewardship and leadership from the two prior experiences at Chick-fil-A and mm -hmm. Farms helped you with transitioning into the new role in the world of finance? Yeah, for sure. So I think stewardship is just understanding that uh what we've been given like when you think of what a steward is it's somebody who's been entrusted something so like when we die we can't take anything with us therefore is it ours to begin with with that so for me when i'm working through this thought process it's like okay well whether it's resources that my boss has given me or these people that have been entrusted to me like it's my job to make them better than before right uh so Chick-fil-A really gave me a lot of resources as a steward to then be able to help like figure that out on my own. I'm not saying I was the best at it at all times, but I had the opportunity to learn. And so coming off that, it gave me a strategic level of stewardship going back to the family business where, you know, like no matter what position I was in, I'm a beneficiary of the family business, but I treat it as if my own because our last name is out on the front gate. Therefore, like I am an owner, right? So when you talk about stewardship, that is the ultimate, like probably level is, man, like we're working hard, we're doing all these things. And now like you have to get people to share that same mindset. Uh, and that comes through way of just building strong relationships. So, you know, when you think, when, if you're going to connect it on a personal level, think how much more you're willing to protect something if somebody has helped promote you and i say promote you being like protect the values that you care about or help provide for your family or do things that you're like man like i really want to help these people make sure that they're taken care of too because they take care of me so it's a very altruistic thing but uh 
you know, moving into finance, I think the more dangerous thing is money, right? It's the one thing, it's the, it's the most talked about resource and the most cared about resource in the world that most people have the biggest misunderstanding of. And a lot of people's emotions and fears and dreams and hopes is all on this one little thing that we, we focus on. And so when I'm giving advice, I've got to take in mind like, okay, like when they're coming to me, the thing that we're both looking at is this pile of money that they care about so much. And it's not the money for a lot of people. It's the things that are attached to it. It's their retirement. It's their kids. It's their parents. It's their whatever the thing is. And so if I don't take that approach of being a good steward of them, not only like their emotions and their money, then like I'm not doing them the best service if I'm making it very transactional. And let's just be real, like people that take a transactional approach just won't go very far in life. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very deep. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and, you know, there, there's a lot that can be said about that attitude, which I think is very valuable in the yeah. finance industry. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, not all the people who work in finance would, um, <laughs> would, would act yeah. like that. Yeah. Do I you mean, you take, like, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, look at recently when you think of all the, the crypto exchanges that went belly up, like, you know, regardless of what you think about, you know, the crypto industry, just look at the, the attitudes and behaviors of these people who were put into position of power to steward these people's money and their greed ended up bankrupting millions of people. Like that's the thing for me, that's just blows my mind. And, you know, no, no, no other than, you know, you may end up in jail or you may be out some money, but like you just destroyed millions of people's lives mm -hmm. and you sold them a lie, you know? So that's, that's really hard for me uh, to, when I see that happening, when, especially when people are out there capital raising and you, and you've probably seen it too, right? Like a lot of slick snake oil salesmen, like, oh yeah, like I'm good at this. I've done this. Like you're seeing deals go bad left and right. And uh, so I'm very wary where I put my money and it's more based on the individual and their character and their integrity. I'm not saying they can't make mistakes. Don't get me wrong, but like I need to know that they're following a value system that is consistent no matter what they're stewarding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about what your company offers, right? So QRP, mm -hmm. you explained what it stands for. I've had some understanding of it. The self-directed IRA, for example, mm -hmm. is I guess kind of common. So can you explain what your company offers? Yeah. So when you say kind of common, that's probably appropriate because <laughs> I would not, I would say the self-directed retirement industry in the traditional sense as people know it is okay. I've got a financial advisor or my company 401k. I want to self-direct. I'm like, okay, yeah, you can do that. Then we'll give you the ability to pick some other stocks that you want. Not like, oh, I'm thinking real estate, private lending, Bitcoin, like all these things outside of Wall Street. So, you know, 2020, a lot happened. Uh, the government opened up the ability for people to pull money out, but there was a massive opportunity for people to take money out of their 401ks and then put it into a, a tool and vehicle that they can then go put into alternative assets. And so for us, we believe fundamentally in control. So people should have the ability to control their money because nobody's going to care about it as much as you. And so it's built on a 401k platform, the self-directed 401k, uh, the people that we serve are, you know, solopreneurs, side hustlers, business owners that have employees. Not many people know that you can do that, but we serve a lot of business owners that, you know, are dumping money into their retirement plans and investing in real estate. Um, so think about it in this sense is there is an opportunity for you if you're w wondering how you could use your retirement dollars to invest in assets that you probably currently are outside of your retirement fund, you can do the same thing with your retirement. You just got to have someone that understands it, knows how to do it. And we take care of all the brain damage for our people. So I like to say we're a do it with you service. Uh, if you're a do it by yourself, probably not a fit. If you're a do it for me, probably not a fit, but we're like the Yoda to Luke Skywalker's journey with a lot of our people because they want to learn how to do it and we get to help them. We don't make the decision for them. We just give them the information to make the best decision for them in their journey. Because like I said, nobody's going to care about your money as much as you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So is it right to say that your company more so kind of facilitates 
mm -hmm. setting up the QRP and the, mm -hmm. way the individuals decide what they want to ultimately invest in? Yeah, so I'll give you a broad overview of uh, like our structure. So as a do it with you service, we're a document provider for our members, but we're a white glove service on the back end. So a lot of the value comes from, hey, I've got this idea of what I want to do with this money, but I first need control. Cool. We get the document set up for them. We get all their money moved over, put it in a bank account to which they can you know, start sending it out. But really what we found is the what next, right? They may have, they may put $50,000 towards the deal that they want to do, but now they're left with, you know, we're just arbitrarily saying, you know, you got 200,000 that you moved over, you put 50 out in a real estate deal. Now you got 150. Now what? Right. So on the back end, we have a community for our people at all our members, 2,500 plus people that come together and start talking about all the things that they're doing, what they're investing in other ways that they can put their money to work. They can buy gold and silver. Uh, you know, the, the vacation, right. Is the thing they're focused on. And so we want to make sure that they can get from A to Z as quick as possible uh, because money just sitting in a bank account, as we know, like isn't going to do you much good, but we're trying to get that money moving for you as quick as possible. And we're just facilitating all the movement, the opportunities, the connections with other people. So there's, if you've got a question about how to do it or where to go or what to invest in or how to do it, like we're the one-stop shop for that because we want your money to keep moving. If it's not moving for you, then you're probably going backwards. <laughs> gotcha. The other question I have for you then is you mentioned that um, a lot of your clients are business owners, entrepreneurs and so forth. Mm -hmm. But if you have, let's say a retirement account that you inherited from a prior employer, can you also do the self-directed IRA? Oh yeah. So, the if you let's just say you're working a w-2 job and you're like man i want to do this self-directing thing uh if you've been if you have an old retirement uh account with a previous employer if you got a traditional ira if you have a 403b there's a ton of things out there that you could roll in and just umbrella up under this one plan so you know you can be a w-2 worker we have plenty of w-2 workers in our community that take part in this and so uh, I do want to be very specific is most people understand like the self-directed IRA, that's the marketed term, but there is the self-directed 401k and that's the platform that we're built on and understanding what both of those are because they're not the same is very important. So making sure you have the right tool is equally as important uh, because if you're investing, let's just use an example in real estate. Well, if you're using a self-directed IRA, debt is probably 99% of the time going to be attached to anything that you do in real estate with your retirement plan. You're going to get taxed on all your profits that you're using versus the 401k, the self-directed 401k vehicle does not have that provision in there. So a lot of people will pay uncle Sam hundreds of thousands of dollars in perpetuity versus if they just switch the vehicle they had, now that money just is now used in perpetuity towards other investments that's taking them to where they want to go. So just being very clear that there are two different types of vehicles out there and understanding which one is equally as important. But for us, the self-directed 401k vehicle is what we built our company on because it provides you the most control, the quickest way uh, to take action. So there's less friction in the process and, uh, you know, allows you more flexibility and complete control over your assets. Uh, let's just say if you wanted gold and silver, you could keep it yourself or your Bitcoin. You could uh, hold stores that yourself uh, versus self-directed IRAs. Those things have to be custodied elsewhere, which, you know, in this day and age, it's, it's a lot better to be able to keep that with yourself versus hope it stays safe elsewhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so that's very important. But how do you how do you qualify for a um, self-directed for 401k? Is it different from how you would be able to qualify for a self-directed IRA? Yeah, so the self-directed IRA is more of a retail based product, right? So anybody and everybody that's breathing and makes money can have one. The 401k, there has to be business activity that supports having a 401k, but there's a lot of things that could qualify and 
the IRS, the way that they use the language in terms of qualification is very broad. Therefore, like, I'll just give you an example. If I was, you know, doing dances on TikTok, trying to generate revenue or build my channel, like that would qualify me for having it. Or if I'm a, an affiliate partner for Home Depot and I'm like, you know, selling stuff for them or trying to, you don't have to generate any income. It's just the intent would qualify you. So there's no reason anybody can't have one, especially in this day and age where we're all doing <laughs> two or three things at the same time, right? Uh, those the that's the big differences between the IRA and the 401k is that business activity, which is broad, supports the 401k, and then the IRA is just a, a retail-based product, uh, which if you're breathing and earning money, have a job, you can qualify to have one. So in other words, the 401k, you have to have a business attached to it. It doesn't have to be a fancy business. As long yeah, as it could be you. Like if you're earning 1099 income, if you're just, you know, like I said, you don't even necessarily have to have a, a business entity established. Like you yourself could be the business entity. Mm. It's just, you have to be conducting business activity that would generate and lead to income, but income isn't necessary or it doesn't have to be present to qualify, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Because I heard about this solo 401k as well, which is mm -hmm. kind of common for real estate investors. Mm -hmm. Does it have to be a solo 401k or is the self-directed 401k can be attached to a business that hires employees as well? Yeah, so I mean, the solo 401k, is, it's the same thing, right? It, it's just the way that they named it. Uh, for us, we have a solo 401k and a 401k for business owners if you have employees. So there's really nothing that should limit you from being able to do this right for yourself. Um, but they're both, they're the same. I would just say for us and what differentiates us from a solo 401k provider is that they just give you the documents and they're like, all right, see you later, like an over the counter product. For us, we're a white glove service because what we found is that the problem on the other side of getting those documents is people are like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And then when they try to call back and get questions or if you're a syndicator raising money and they're calling you for the questions because they can't get it from their place, they're, you as a syndicator don't understand what how any of it works. So we take on all that brain damage for them and then help them strategize, not only with getting their money out to the investment opportunity, but then, okay, hey, look, we've got you know, a big fat nest egg here. Let's talk through how we're going to get this working for you as well. So that's what differentiates us from the other providers out there is it's just the documents. See you later with us. We like to go on the journey with them. That makes a lot of sense. How do you kind of gather the different, let's say investment vehicles that are possible, right? Because you mentioned real estate, you mentioned mm -hmm. crypto, and maybe some other valuable metal like gold uh -huh. what are other options that you present and how do you usually gather them to present to your customers yeah so we aren't advisors first off i'll be very clear on that is that we if someone comes to us they typically know what they want to invest in first but then the follow-up questions is well what else can i do well the reality is is what else do you have access to right um so we don't present in we don't present deals to them necessarily like, Hey, we're just going to bring you all this stuff. That's why we have the community piece. So it organically can happen as they're making connections and talking with people. And you know, we have syndicators in our community, investors, you name it, you have deals and you have money. And so we try to marry them together for the organic piece to happen, which is very valuable. Um, so if you're to say, what can they invest in? Oh, the, the, probably more important question is what can't they invest in, which is what we try to, to give them advice on is, you know, you can't invest in collectibles, the vertical lineage, you can't invest like your grandparents, mom, dad, you know, kid, grandkid, but you can invest with people on the, uh, on the horizontal piece. Right. So all those questions get brought up to us and we help kind of steer them and extrapolate that information from them. And, we don't want to send them on wild goose chases because a lot of people are like, well, you know, I could go do this. And I'm like, well, what's your information like confidence of that? Well, I don't really know. I was like, well, probably don't do that. Like stick with what you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> just go invest in more real estate. If you know it, like there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Earlier you mentioned that 
I want to say, was it the founder of this company who spoke to you and you said that he's a very good salesman? Can you also try to sell to us why having control over your retirement account is so important compared to just investing in stocks, mutual funds, et cetera? Well, like, let's just kind of put it like this. What's at stake, right? Uh, are you confident with the way things are going? Are you confident that inflation is going to slow down? Are you confident that Wall Street is going to beat the money, the money printing that's happening in Washington? Are you confident that you're going to, that your money that you've been promised that is going to be there for you with all your hopes and dreams that you've actually not communicated to your fidelity, whoever's managing your money on the other side, you've got this idea of like what it's going to look like and they have no idea, nor do they care. Uh, my thing is, is the nobody, first off, like I said, is going to care about the money as much as you. Uh, if you take that control, the likelihood of you taking the knowledge that you currently have and applying it towards other assets out there that consistently beat Wall Street's returns, right, over the course of time. Like, my thing is just, like, are you confident that you're keeping up? And if you're not, then you need to change direction. You have to. You have to because your family depends on you your spouse depends on you your kids depend on you uh and you need to do it for yourself and so uh, that is the, the the biggest pain point today that we see people come in is the lack of confidence uh and most people if they really ask that question go yeah but it's too hard i don't understand well hey lucky for you we take care of all that brain damage for you you don't even have to worry about it. just say hey i want to start i want to move cool we'll start walking the journey with you which Hey, Frodo didn't get to throw the ring into the fire without Samwise Gamgee. So I like to say we're the Samwise Gamgee for people too, if you need that uh, that good friend in your corner. <laughs> so I think I'm hearing there are a lot of external factors that we can control um, mm -hmm. that influence inflation, influence the stock market. That's why it's good to have this option to invest in something that can protect you from that. Um, and real estate keeps coming up and you mentioned syndicators a couple of times. For mm -hmm. the listeners who are not familiar with a syndication real estate deal, can you explain what it is and why it's better than some other <laughs> vehicles? <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. So think about this. Uh, a lot of you on your drive to work or wherever you're going each day, you have no idea of how many uh, properties that you pass that are most likely owned by investors. You just see it and you're like, oh, cool. Somebody owns that building. Well, really, it's a collective group of people that own that building or retail uh, shopping centers or whatever. So what a syndication is, is really a group of people who come together, pull their money to go acquire something. You've got your GPs who, you know, sponsors that step in and say, hey, we're going to manage this deal. And then they will give the return to the investors and you pay the GPs for their work. Um, so when you're looking at opportunities to go put your money to work in these deals which real assets fortunately grow while inflation unfortunately continues to stay rampant which is like the advantage for you putting your money to work in that it's more of a hedge now i'm not saying that it's guaranteed right i don't want to speak in absolutes but um being able to take your money and invest in a syndication, there's tons of them out there. It's real estate, Bitcoin, private lending, debt funds, you name it. Like there's so many things out there that you can syndicate. Uh, and a lot of more and more people each day are pulling their money out of the Wall Street traditional system and putting them in these syndications because they're giving them more hope of a brighter future. And they can actually go touch and see the thing they're investing in. Like even if I invested a million dollars in Tesla, like I can't call up there and say, Hey, I don't like the way you're doing it. They're like, ah, we don't care. Like they, I probably won't even be able to get the front desk of the person that runs the building. Right. So, um, but if you're calling a syndicator, somebody you've put your money with, they're going to take your call. You're going to be able to go up there and walk around and see it yourself. And there's a lot more hope and confidence in that than, you know, doing it the other way. That's great. And then the other thing I heard from your, um, prior answers was um, you really should have some sort of sense of what you're investing in, right? So that comes mm -hmm. from education, which we should all have. So what do you think the role of education plays in financial freedom? 
I mean, education is important. I think we should always be testing our truth and our paradigms because uh, being closed minded is very dangerous in a very fluid world when it comes to money and things change on a daily basis. And so if you're not continuing to educate yourself with new ways to acquire money or invest your money or, you know, even on your on a personal level, then you're you're going to be way behind. Uh, and so for me, I just use myself as an example. Education has uh, I started testing my old paradigms with new information. And it's a it's an ego thing when we're met with a new piece of information that we may not initially agree with. But when we start and ask, hmm, how might this benefit me or how might debt if you like don't fundamentally believe in debt? It's like, OK, well, let go of that and just ask, well, how might debt actually help me get to where I want to go? And can I do it in a way that still doesn't violate my values? Like those are the questions you have to use. And as you obtain more information and start thinking through that, you start taking these little steps further and further. But education is only the first part. You actually have to apply it. So once you apply it, then you get more comfortable. Then you can evaluate that experience and either maintain that education that you've received and build on it or throw it away if it didn't work like that's just that's how the game works so you got to continually just test your paradigms test new information that comes in and without and without growing that you'll net you won't be able to filter new information that comes in because you've thrown out everything else along the way and you're just going to be stuck where you're at and you have impressed me with the knowledge you have for three years, right? You said you have been with the <laughs> company. Yeah. I think that's, that's a lot to learn. And I'm sure it's complicated, even though we try to make it simple, usually, um, at least to begin with. So do you have any tips for learning new things? And, you know, yeah, I mean, don't it's like, look, if you're trying to learn how to dunk a basketball, don't go try and start on a 10 foot goal, because you're just gonna, you know, discourage yourself. Uh, start small. Like if you're just, if you're listening and you're asking like, well, I don't even know what any of this means. I don't know how to do it. Uh, you know, maybe your approach needs like, well, I need, I just need help. Okay. Well go find a mentor, go find somebody first who is where you want to be. They're living the life that you would like to have. Um, and then just start asking them questions, ask them like, Hey, how did you get to where you are? Just very open ended questions. Um, if you're trying to invest for the first time, like don't put like two or three dollars into something. If, if, if that's a lot of money to you, then great. But if you're going to invest and get into the game, you want to put enough in that makes you pay attention. And for me, that's how I started. Like I've, I've, I've made so many moves, some dumb, some good. Uh, but without taking that action and, and putting something there that made me squirm and be like, ooh, because... I learned so much by just watching what the market was doing. I'd be like, huh, well, why did that happen? Oh, well, this is going on. Oh, that's going on. Oh, maybe that had an effect. And then you start seeing all these things playing together. And so uh, get a good assessment level of where you're at from a investment standpoint. And then just don't, don't look, like I said, a hundred yards down the field, just look at the next yard ahead of you and be like, okay, well, I need to get there before I get to the end zone. Like, you can't go from the 10 yard line to the end zone like that. You got to get the 20, the 30, the 40 and keep working the field and just be patient, like, and give yourself grace along the way. Cause you will make mistakes. That's just part of the game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In helping your customers in participating in the member discussion and so forth. Do you also grab those opportunities? If you think that they fit with your financial goals? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, why not? You know, for mm -hmm. me, uh, you know, currently uh, we have a sister company that is just that's finishing and finalizing a, a trust manufacturing plant out in Phoenix. We'll call it impact investing. I like personally, I like to invest in businesses. Why? Because it employs people. Uh, I understand business as a whole. Uh, I'm not an expert in it by any means, but it makes sense to me. So like I can I can understand what's happening on the balance sheet. You know, you got a product, you got a service, you got the logistics to get the thing out and then, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so I'm, I got my money there and then I also lost 50 grand on uh, 
uh, my first thing, which is I went out and bought some Bitcoin, but yeah. uh, I got tied up in the, well, this was the platforms with Voyager. Um, and I'd done all my research. I'd done like, I had a guy that worked with the CEO of Voyager. Everything seemed fine. And then all of a sudden the rug got pulled because they had attached themselves to another company. It was just, you know, it just blew up. And regardless of whatever the investment was, I lost. And that was hard to deal with. Um, but I'm glad I did it because it's a cheap learning lesson with that amount of money versus if I had just taken the same information and it had more resources, like four or $5 million. And I, you know, wasn't any smarter then than I am now. Like that's a, that's a very cheap MBA to get and knowing that like, Hey, it's a long tail game. You may have lost on the first, but that doesn't mean you're going to lose on the second or the third. It's just part of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It also came through from your kind of speech earlier that um, you are a believer um, in God. And uh, mm -hmm. I think I saw from your bio too, you had some statements about that. So can you um, talk about the intersection between faith and financial empowerment? Ooh, girl, you're going to get <laughs> me up going. Um, so <sighs> money is such an interesting thing. Uh, I'm only going to speak from my experience is I have found more joy in my life by submitting to a power that is greater than me, that has guided my life and my decisions, whether it be with work or my finances um, and submitting my plans to like my plans are just what I think is best for me, but that's not doesn't mean what God has what's best for me. And watching people make decisions with money, watching where their heart is, you know, where your treasure is, there your heart is also like, I see so much of that on a daily basis. And I have to check myself, right, when I'm in this world, because I can get caught up like, oh, you know, chasing the thing or focusing on the, you know, where I want to be. And that's not the thing that matters. And so what I've really been on a mission on is understanding what money is at its, at its core it's a resource. It's a tool. It's the means, but it's not the means to, or it's not the end. It's just a means to the end. So that's why I talk about steward leadership. Like, so if God gives me these resources, okay, Lord, like his shovel is much bigger than mine and being able to give more and more and more, that's where I find so much joy. And so when I like give resources away and with me, with my little shovel, I'm like, Oh yeah, it's awesome. Like God has this massive shovel and just, can dump more. So, uh, you know, for, I, like I said, I, I, I process so much each and every day with that. And I talk with my wife on a regular basis, but, um, God, God has money is the most talked about, uh, subject in the Bible. Why is that? Because he used money or he understood that money was chief in man's heart which is why he spoke about it so much and he had to speak about it because it's the only way it could get our attention to understand the things that he was teaching in scripture so um i think that if a lot of people dig in and understand that god gives us a really great blueprint on what money is and how we're to use it and what our attachment to it should be uh we could live a much more fulfilled life and understand that like when we come into resources, uh, the first question is, am I focused on the gift or am I focused on the giver? And so for me, I always want to be focused on the giver. And no matter if he gives me more, or gives me less, he still gives it to me regardless. And I'm like, all right, now what do I do with this? You know, so stuff isn't bad. Like the nice houses aren't bad. Nice cars aren't bad. Like, you know, going out to eat at a nice dinner isn't bad. Uh, but if we make that our identity and our focus and our purpose, then it's going to take us down a road that we're going to have a lot of heartache. That's excellent. Yeah, to me, I feel like the other aspect is um, kind of overcoming fear, right? Because I think some people, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, they don't want to invest because they feel like it's risky and, you know, who knows what's <clears> going to happen. But um, there is, um, where, where did that come from? Ab about multiplying your talents. I think it, yep. it's translation thing but you know i think it means coins in that specific context 
to me, at least, I feel like um, it, it, it's a very powerful lesson. So mm-hmm. to take calculated risk and to really use your brain and, you know, talent, so to speak, to multiply is is very important. You shouldn't just let it sit under your pillow and, you know, it's not going to do anything. It might actually go down because of inflation. Yeah. I mean, God's given us brains for a reason, right? Mm-hmm. He's given us wisdom and discernment and you know, evaluated experience is the best experience, right? That is wisdom. And so, you know, you talk about fear, you know, fear not is mentioned in the Bible 365 times, huh? Coincidence, like God doesn't do anything by stance. So like every single day of the year, you could look at the scriptures that say fear not or do not fear. Um, And I agree with you, like a lot of times with money, people think that investing is bad or could be bad or but it's not like those two servants that went out and took the resources they had to give an account for when they came back. Like they went out and multiplied it because that's what their ser- their master would have done. Mm-hmm. So they wanted to please their master by saying, Hey, like I went and I took this and I made these moves and I actually turned your two into four or your, you know, five into 10. And what did he do with the one that just buried it and played it safe? He said, like, you know, you're dead to me. Like you didn't, you, you didn't, You didn't do what I would have done. I don't bury it. I go out and I make it. And what's funny is like, even if they lost it, he probably would have been, at least you tried to do what I would have done, but it was the one who did nothing. They just were like, nope, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do anything with it. So (laughs) you're spot on with that. Yeah. What is in your future plan, either for yourself um, or for the company EQRP? What's kind of the, let's say five, 10 year plan and what are the key priorities and goals? Yeah. Well, you know, a, a lot of people probably would just maybe dismiss me when I say this. I can't focus on a three, five, 10 year plan. I can look out and envision, but like when I look at my own life and how that's happened, like I'm not where I should have been based on my three or five or 10 year plan, like nowhere close. Mm-hmm. So for me, I take it at a one year approach and then kind of look out in the distance because I know things aren't always going to just be exactly how I you know want it to be. And so uh, for me, I'm just where my feet are at right now. I'm happy. I love what I'm doing. I love the people that I get to serve. I love the people that I work with. They're amazing. Uh, and I always say it's the most responsibility that I've ever held uh, with the least amount of stress because I have such an amazing team. Um, so in this season, this is where I'm at for the company. Uh, what we've done a really great job on is building an amazing uh, guest member experience for our people. And which, you know, coming from Chick-fil-A, I could kind of dovetail off that and talk about moves that they've made and why they were successful, especially diving into the tech space because they had a very sound guest experience for their people. So for us, making sure that we have that dialed in actually sets us up to take on new ventures when it comes to integrating technology with what we're doing, creating a more seamless experience, uh, because you're always going to fall back to, well, when I need help, who do I call or what do I go to or how do I get my problem solved? But companies that just go straight tech and they don't have the service piece, they just fail. And we see it happen all the time. So that's where we're focused at looking forward is building a more seamless experience for our people to where they can have information quicker. Uh, they can make better decisions. They can connect with other people more seamlessly. And that's the focus for probably the next 12 to 24 months. Nice. How can people join this community if they're interested after listening to what we talked about? Yeah. Uh, so you can go to eqrp.com. Uh, reach out to us. We have free consultations. Just call and like, we don't treat people like robots. Like your story is important. Your context of your life's important, important. And this may be a fit for you. It may not, but it has to start with asking the questions first. So go to eqrp.com, reach out to us there. We also give out free newsletters, uh, turnkeyretirement.com. We have podcasts, all sorts of stuff that you can engage us with. Um, We're just giving the self-directed retirement game away for free. So it's really fun for us to, you know, banter and talk with each other about what's happening in the world of finance. Cool. Cool. And then two more questions for you before we wrap up. Do you have any book recommendations? 
Yeah. So first book recommendation is probably Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Okay. Great book. How I got started uh, with my world of you know investing and then uh, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. You should mm -hmm. go read it. It's amazing. Cool. I've definitely read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but I'm going to mm -hmm. check out the second one. Yeah. Cool. All right. Last question. Where can people find out more about you? I think you mentioned how to get in touch with the company, but if people want to find more about yourself, you know, is there a way to kind of get in touch with you? Uh, yeah. So very active on LinkedIn. That's honestly where I've kind of put a lot of my time, effort and focus uh, on there. So LinkedIn is the best place to find me. Uh, and, you know, if you ever find me, maybe one of the Twitter spaces rooms, just listen to stuff going on. It's probably the only place you'd find me because I'm more of like a lurker on Twitter. I don't really post much, but I do consume most of my news from Twitter. So, okay. Are there any particular people that you follow that are helpful? Oof. Um, kind of depends on what, right? But I, uh, I have a myriad of people that I follow. I like... Uh, there's this, there, I'll give you the, the best follow that I like because it gives me just a lot of macro data. It's called a Cabisi letter. Um, they just present information. There's no like political tie to the information. It's just, hey, here's a snapshot of what's actually happening right now. Uh, take it and do with it whatever you think. So I get a lot of really great information uh, from that account in particular. And then, um, you know, I'm, I'm a very curious, I like to follow AI people who are in the dev space doing that, uh, Bitcoin. And all of it's just because I'm fascinated about what's happening down the road and what this technology is doing for us. Mm -hmm. um, so I like following all that too. <laughs> yeah, no, sounds very interesting. Yeah, cool. All right. Thank you so much, Parker. This has been really great. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, you know, if there's anything you guys need out there, please feel free to reach out. Oh,